Hello? There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Open Government keynote and plenary panel. We're thrilled to have you all here today. Uh, we recognize that uh, the sun is shining and the beautiful city of Tallinn and, uh, awaits us, uh, but we're happy that you're going to uh, let it wait a little bit longer uh, and join us for this um, uh, panel, uh, which I think is going to be very exciting. We have an opportunity to hear from um, the U.S. perspective on open government, and we also have the opportunity to have um, what I think is going to be a very energetic conversation with uh, the panel, which brings um, to the table a number, I think, of very exciting perspectives. Um, my name is Teresa Pardo. I am the director of the Center for Technology and Government at the University at Albany in the state of New York. Um, I'm also actually one of the conference co-chairs for ICEGOV this year, and so um, I would like to add my congratulations to the team uh, in Estonia at the Governance Academy and all of their colleagues uh, for putting together such a wonderful uh, conference uh, here in Estonia. And um, frankly, they've put a little bit of fear into uh, my thinking these days, as ICEGOV will be uh, in Albany, uh, hosted by my organization next year. And I'm starting to wonder if that was such a good idea. <laughs> But we, we, will, we will take on the challenge, uh, and we will, uh, we will welcome you tomorrow, officially, uh, to join us uh, in New York. So my um, pleasure today is to tell you about the keynote, and to introduce the keynote speaker, and then to work um, with the panel to moderate the conversation uh, about open government to contribute, or co uh, contribute to the ideas that have already uh, been put on the table. So as this slide says, uh, Chris Vian uh, will talk with you about um, open government in the U.S., outlining the directive, talking a bit about the, Nas the NASA government plan in particular. Um, NASA in the U.S. is the National uh, Airspace Aeronautical Airspace. Airspace Agency, the, Nas the National Airspace Agency. Um, and um, he'll close his keynote with an overview of the open government partnership that was launched last week. Um, in the U.S., and, um, but, but not by the U.S., but in the U.S. Um, and Chris Vian, I think in his remarks as well, will tell you about um, innovation and the way he thinks uh, about the innovation strategies and the, and the ways that he brings those ideas uh, to the work that he does, both in the White House and, and where he came from prior to that. But before we get started, I'd just like to give you a little more thorough introduction um, to Chris uh, and the role that he's played uh, in the U.S. Uh, and around the world. Chris Vian is the Deputy U.S. Chief Technology Officer for Government Innovation in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. <clears throat> in this role, Chris searches for those with transformative ideas, convenes those inside and outside government to explore and test those ideas, and catalyzes those results into a national action plan. Before he went to the White House, Chris was the chief information officer of one of my favorite cities in the U.S., um, San Francisco, um, where he led the city to become a national force in the application of new media platforms, open source applications, and the creation of new models for expanded digital inclusion. This year, Chris was again named to the top 50 public sector CIOs by Information Week magazine. He has been named to Government Technology Magazine's top 25 dreamers, doers, and drivers, and honored as the Community Broadband Visionary of the Year by the National Association of Telecommunication Officers and Advisors. Chris has brought his long-time commitment to innovation and inclusion to the work that he's done at the White House, and so I'm very, very pleased and proud to be able to um, have him join you here um, today and, and share his remarks on these ideas. Chris? There we go. There you go. Well, every time I hear that introduction, I feel like I should be saying, and he solved world peace, too. Um, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a v I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's my first time to Estonia, and it's my first time to really understand and appreciate the work that is going on in Estonia and in this region, and I marvel at what you've been, been able to accomplish. And I also marvel at your willingness to share your lessons learned with the rest of us 
as we too can have the um, Estonian experience and take advantage of it. When I was in San Francisco, um, I had the opportunity to really develop my own model. I was the chief information officer for five years, an unheard of opportunity. And in that time in the city and county of San Francisco, I looked at an amazingly complex government structure for the city and county of San Francisco. We, we had a budget, an annual budget of 6.5 billion US dollars. We had 55 departments, 120 organizations, 44 union contracts, and 30,000 employees. And I looked at the technology that was keeping that huge ship afloat. And like most organizations, we had business verticals. There were all of the transportation agencies and all of the public safety agencies and all of the health agencies. And I looked at the data and the systems and the applications that each one was using separate from the others. And I started having this picture in my head of a stick with, um, like the jugglers use, uh, hats or bowls spinning. And I had all of these sticks with all of these spinning systems not working, not talking with each other. And then I looked at the private sector. In San Francisco, we are very lucky to have Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Netflix really um, leading companies. And they too had all of these systems, data, and applications moving and weren't talking to each other. And I thought, what if we could actually get them to share? What if we could start taking advantage of each other and really, truly starting to do a public-private partnership? If you've ever been in San Francisco, you also know that we are very blessed with a committed group of individuals who want to be co-creators of any solutions that are developed either in the private sector or the public sector. And we also, finally, have the proximity to Silicon Valley. And we have access to the, the lessons learned, the experience of all of those technology companies. And what they've described now, according to Eric Ries, a, a friend of mine and a, and a um, best-selling author, is something called the Lean Startup, where what makes Silicon Valley and startup companies work is that the first thing they do is they ask the customer what they need. They take that back, they design a product or service, they then, in a minimal viable product way, put it back out in the market and let the customers or the users basically say, you got it right, or that is really bad, let me tell you how to improve it. And through that iterative process, companies are made successful because they're doing it with their customers. They're doing it with their users. What a concept. What if government didn't do an RFI and then an RFP, and then four years later, we get something that we no longer need because we spent four years following a procurement process that no longer supports our needs. I offer that as a beginning story because this was my foundation in San Francisco, and this is my foundation when I come to the White House, and I really figure out how to apply all of those lessons, all of those possibilities to the federal government. So, the theory of the case. So you might, and you should, say, Chris, sounds really good, prove it. So, what are the challenges? I think making government stronger is one of the first challenges that we have. And I believe that transparency actually makes government stronger. Because how can you improve what you can't measure? And you can't measure if you haven't released the data. Second, I think to make government more efficient, you need to participate. We need to involve our customers in our decision-making process. And the final one is collaboration. 
Um, I think, and you will hear a little bit later, that a key component in the open government partnership is our work with civil society organizations. And this is a new field or a new direction for many of us. And what we've come to realize is whether it's the civil society organizations or a mom and pop grocery store, other people have insight and value that we need in order to be successful. And it's through that collaboration that we truly can innovate. So how do we do that? The first and foremost point I'd like to make is that government doesn't always have to have the solution. In fact, oftentimes what government should do is create the platform to provide the infrastructure, the data, the systems, whatever it is, so that others can create on top of that and potentially compete against each other. The second is that we need to catalyze information and growth, innovation and growth. Innovation now is kind of the buzzword. It's the latest word about what we need to be doing. We need to be innovative. We need to innovate. In fact, uh, my title is Deputy United States Chief Technology Officer for Government Innovation. It's a really long title. It's hard to fit on a card. And you know, it, we use this word catalyze, but it really is to cause innovation and growth to happen. And finally, and much of what you all know, is that technology is a key enabler. In my cell phone, I have more technology and computing power than NASA had when they put the man on the moon. In my backpack, I've got a greeting card that has a little chip on there that sings a song to me. I'm going to throw that card away, but what it signifies, though, in that little chip that I'm going to throw away is more computing power than all of the Allied forces had during World War II. My Game Boy that I have at home actually has more computing power than most mainframe systems of decades ago. Technology has become cheap, it's become ubiquitous, and it's become unbelievably powerful, and as a result is a prime enabler of what we're talking about. What you see on the right is an example of when I talk about government as a platform. It is data.gov, and it is where we, on the federal level, have re released about 300,000 data sets to the public for use. Another example is challenge.gov, where we have actually gotten legislation passed, the America Competes Act, that allows us to create challenges and potentially give prizes away to actually focus citizens, small business, on solutions